dawn alarm. Raiders across the coast. Royal Air Force propellers are whirring. Fighters are straining against the chocks, ready for the pilots who sprint to their machines to give them the gun and leap to the aerial defense of Britain. Day by day, over England's embattled isle continues the heroic fight for freedom. Empire pilots hurl into the fray the fastest, fiercest warplanes in the world, whose breathtaking exploits have thrilled every nation, with the possible exception of the enemy. Australia also thrills with pride at the miraculous achievements of both men and machines. And Australia follows the lead of the homeland. For her defense, she now makes her own warplanes and in a year creates one of the greatest aircraft factories in the world at Fisherman's Bend, Melbourne. Here on the tarmac, outside the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation's factory, is an Australian-made Wiraway, a trainer, fighter, bomber designed by Australian experts, made by Australian workmen from Australian materials. And metal, fashioned from the ore that lies in the heart of Mother Earth, arrives in ingots at the factory, then into this glowing open hearth furnace. And now, as the furnace is tapped, you see the molten metal run out, a white hot river into the waiting moulds, then into the quenching water, steam rising and hissing in angry protest as tireless Australian workmen forge it into the nation's defence. Thus the molten metal is ladled into the moulds, there to take its first semblance of the shape of things to come. All metal is tested before it leaves the manufacturer and again at the factory before it's accepted. No chances are taken at Fisherman's Bend. And now, looking a little more businesslike as the bandsaw cuts the metal parts of a future Pratt and Whitney aero engine, the power behind the wings of the Wiraway, parts that are polished into smoothness by hand, ready for machining in the only factory in the world in which the airframe and engine of an aeroplane are made in the same plant. Built on reclaimed land two years ago, this factory has become the cradle of the Royal Australian Air Force. Here, passing before you, are the parts of the Pratt and Whitney engine and the machine tools that make them. Milling machines, gear generators and hobbing machines which cut through the tough steel for the gears. And there, the angle spindle drill, boring valve stem holes in a cylinder head. Now a trolley load of completed heads ready to be given a final finish by hand. Australian workmen's hands, as deftly and efficiently doing their job as the men who will soon race through the air in the planes they've made. Each finger's touch in this factory as sure as the pressure that will later hose a stream of lead into the Nazi enemy. There are many kinds of grinders used, but this is a Churchill grinder, here seen grinding a crankshaft. And a pretty good grinder of cranks it is. Although modern machine tools are almost uncanny in their accuracy, some finishing operations must still be done by skillful hands. The master rod, lifeline of an engine. The rod that carries eight other connecting rods is here being checked by a micrometer with the standard gauge. Any error is as bad as a mile out when there's nothing between the pilot and death but the master rod of his engine. Then a boiling oil bath for the master rod and an ice pack for the main bearing sleeve. Dry ice is used to contract the sleeve which is then slipped into the hot master rod. The sleeve, expanding as the chill wears off, and the rod contracting as it cools, ensuring an absolute tight fit. Now the other eight connecting rods are attached to the master, just like a huge starfish. The broaching machine performs the important task of cutting the splines that loose couple the crankshaft to the propeller boss. Looking somewhat like a Swiss cheese is the crankcase, subject of many kinds of drilling, boring and facing operations. And here are crankcase ends with their intricate gas passages. The main assembly table on which is a complete set of parts, numbering some thousands, used in the construction of a Pratt and Whitney single row aero engine. These are ready for assembly. The highest possible standard is set in this factory to ensure that only the best methods and materials go into the making of a Wiraway so that our pilots never need fear of being let down by their aircraft. But it's simple everyday work to these Australians. Every man is a specialist in this war of specialists, at home and abroad, on the ground and in the air. Each expert is adding one little bit more to the great victory effort. The actual assembly seen here is a careful painstaking job and needs a high degree of technical skill. Careless assembly can ruin an engine even before it feels the air. This engine, rapidly nearing completion on a convenient rotating table, will soon be ready for its stringent tests. 
Now assembled, ready for duty, here are rows of completed motors. Aeroplane engines made in Australia. Now think what that means. Think back a couple of years when it sounded a dream. But today, Australia is making her own engines for her own planes. Making them before she has made motor car engines. Conquering the air before the roads in the urgent hour of the Empire's destiny. That's war for you. And here is Australia's Wiraway assembly plant. Colonel of our defence. Something to make Hitler grunt in his mountain lair. Finished engines, frames, wings for Australia's Wiraways. Rods, tubes, structural parts of all descriptions. Australia's answer to the challenge to freedom is being forged by Australian workmen, moulded and patterned here at Fisherman's Bend. This is called a drop hammer, and although it weighs several tons, its force can be regulated to vary from a one-pound smack to a three-ton blow. But it really does the big jobs, pounding sheet metal into different shapes for such parts as the engine carving, the sort of thing that can't be done by a hydraulic press. Next comes a folding press, bending more metal. Here's a glimpse of a workbench lined with small metal parts that are so important to structural strength. Here is a spot welding machine at work. And there you see the main spar and the wing being assembled, and again drilling and riveting the hole into a whirraway wing. These rivets are made of duralumin, an aluminium alloy, and aluminium is one of the few things Australia has to import, but not for long. Young Australian lads at the Sydney Technical College have discovered a new process, which, if successful, even the aluminium parts of our planes will be made here. Now it's beginning to look something like an aeroplane as these men put the finishing touches to the wing. This is the centre section inverted to receive the petrol tank, which carries the lifeblood of the Wiraways. More steel and alloy tubes used in building the fuselage or body, the backbone of an aeroplane. And here deft hands and oxy flames weld the tube into the rigid framework. There are six stages in the assembling of a plane. Starting with the bare frame, the firewall is fitted. Next comes the hydraulic equipment and its pipelines, which feed oil under pressure to the rams that operate brakes, wing flaps and retractable landing gear. Then comes the electrical equipment with more than 600 yards of wire to each machine complicated switchboards and control panels. Then the centre section with the undercarriage. Machine guns are mounted, wings are fitted. Cables and rods that operate the control surfaces are adjusted. Then comes the Pratt and Whitney engine being wheeled in ready for fitting. Engine mounted, cowling attached, and the Wiraway is now ready for the rigid Royal Australian Air Force inspection, which is in addition to the company's own inspection. It's in quarantine until passed by Air Force experts. But you can't fly without the propeller. And here is the Hamilton variable pitch air screw, which enables the engine to develop its full power for taking off and climbing. The three blades are here being fitted to the hub that houses the delicate mechanism for automatically changing the pitch. Now you will see how delicate is the balance of this screw. Just a handkerchief swings down the blade, which is far heavier than the weight used in the actual test. And the man behind all this is Wing Commander Wackett, who for years insisted that Australia could and should make her own planes. With him is Mr. A.G. Brown, Secretary of Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation. At Wagga Training School, you see a row of finished Wiraways, grim fighting units of the Australian Air Force. Trainee pilots ready to test their mettle join their courage and their nerve with the start machines fellow Australians have built them to fly. After receiving instructions, they turn towards their machine. Each pilot boards his plane and the Wiraways prepare to take off. Propellers cut the air like a knife and off they go, winging away like newly evolved moths from their cocoons. Wings over Australia. Wings shaped tenderly, firmly in this chrysalis of the Wiraway. Blunt-nosed, deadly-looking machines in perfect formation letting the young Australian aboard get the feel of the air as they gaily start their training in the ever-widening battle of the skies. Australian eagles soaring into the Australian sky. Australian planes, their engines roaring a proud song, a glad song of Australian achievement. And with them surges on with the unconquerable spirit of men who blazed the first hazardous trails across the southern skies. Russ Smith, Bert Hinkler, Charles Owen, Kingsford Smith. From the Ammons Valhalla, they see Australian youth glorious in its courage, magnificent in its daring, blazoning to the world their challenge. In the steady hands that control these Australian warplanes lies a mighty responsibility. These machines, these men who fly them, form the Commonwealth's first line of defense, wings of empire. Upon them, the spirit of our nation aspires. <laughs>